113 Questions About Evolution with John Perry. Evolutionary question number 27. Endogenous retroviruses. Why does natural selection keep them around so long? Tens of millions of years in some cases. Welcome back everyone, John Perry here. Today we continue our little mini-series inside of the larger mini-series where I'm responding to specific questions that were sent to me by young Earth creationists who were upset by an animation I did on the Stated Clearly channel about endogenous retroviruses. Now if you haven't seen that animation yet, I do recommend that you stop this video and go over there and watch it. I do have a link to that animation down in the video description, so it's nice and easy for you to find it and then come back. Go watch that, then come back here. It's important that you have a really solid grasp of retroviruses and endogenous retroviruses before you watch this video right here. So, without further ado, let's let's take a look at the, the question that was sent to me by these guys. I want to ask stated clearly, I want to ask him if these really are just junk, if these really are just the ancient remnants of viral infections millions of years ago, then why did the cell decide to keep them around for so long? It's wasteful of energy and resources for the cell. Selection should have eliminated this junk. So the meat of his question is actually a really good question. Why is it that natural selection permits ERVs to stick around for so long? I do want to address some of the wording that he used in that question. Why did the cell decide to keep them around for so long? The cell isn't really choosing anything. The cell was forced to have that genome in it. The virus forced its way into the cell and inserted that into the cell. The cell can't tell the virus genome from its own genome. It's really kind of... Uh, a victim in this whole scenario. It's up to the process of descent with modification acted upon by natural selection to get rid of this. So that brings us to, again, the meat of his question. Why doesn't natural selection eliminate ERVs? Well, truth be told, natural selection does eliminate ERVs, but it can take a while. Here is one of many papers talking about how it is that the process of descent with modification acted upon by selection can eliminate ERVs. I'll have to do a whole video on that sometime because it's actually really interesting, but that's for another day. Even though ERVs can be eliminated, it often takes a long time, and it takes a long time for several well-known reasons. The first reason is what we actually talked about last week. ERVs get into our genomes when there is a pandemic, a pandemic of retroviruses. And if the pandemic is really bad, everyone's genomes in that population, they're going to be littered with ERVs. A lot of those ERVs might be bad for the host who inherits them because they might actually still be able to make viruses and make that host sick. But if a mutation has disabled that virus just enough so that it can no longer make its host sick, but it's still able to make the proteins that viruses normally make to stop other viruses from entering the cell once they're already in it, then this specific endogenous retrovirus, it can be beneficial for that host. It can allow that host to have more offspring, and that ERV can spread until it reaches fixation, until every member of the species has that ERV. Recently, I had a viewer ask me how fixation of retroviruses is obtained. This is one way that a virus genome will end up in every single organism's genome in the entire population. It's beneficial at least during that pandemic. So that's all fine and well. If an ERV happens to be beneficial out of the box, of course it can stick around. Natural selection will not weed it out. It's, it's benefiting its host. But what about ERVs that have been legitimately disabled? And when I say that, I mean every one of its proteins is disabled. It's not producing active viable proteins anymore. And what about when even its, its regulatory sequences aren't having any sort of an effect on the host? How does something like that stick around? And this is a really interesting question because a virus genome can be up to 10,000 nucleotides long. We know that if a mutation is neutral, natural selection might never select against it. We know that if a mutation is nearly neutral, natural selection will select against it, but it could take millions of years to actually purge that mutation from a population. But how could we say that a, a viral insertion, an insertion of 10,000 base pairs, could be nearly neutral? How is that so? This guy even said in his question, It's wasteful 
of energy and resources for the South. Selection should have eliminated this junk. Is he right? Is this actually taxing on the cell? Surprisingly, the answer is no, not really. And one of the reasons for this is that the human genome is 3 billion base pairs long. That's the haploid genome. The full thing is, you know, twice that. For me, when I see a number like 10,000 compared to 3 billion, both of them look big. <laughs> Both of them look huge, right? And it's hard for me to really visualize exactly what that difference is. And the other day I was thinking, how could I do this? I was cooking dinner and had a five pound bag of rice that I was using. And I'm like, oh, this is a good idea. What if we compared the human genome? So just imagine that this three billion base pairs is represented by a five pound bag of rice. That's 2,268 grams for those of you who care about grams. If a five pound bag of rice is the human genome, how much rice would we need to represent the virus genome? I'm curious what your intuition would tell you. I want you to pause this video here in just a second, and I want you to go down in the comment section and tell me intuitively what you think that number would be. If the human genome, all three billion base pairs, is just five pounds of rice, how much rice would we need to represent 10,000 base pairs, which is the Rough, roughly the genome of a virus. Okay, pause the video right now and send me your answers. So, you did it, right? You, you went down there in the comment section and you actually put your, your guess, an honest guess. You didn't do the math first or anything. We will go over the numbers here in just a second. But, okay, I trust you. So, the first time that I thought about this, like my very first thought, the first thing that popped into my head was, oh, maybe it's like, I don't know, one fourth of a cup of rice. That doesn't seem like very much compared to a five pound bag of rice. One fourth of a cup, that sounded reasonable for a second. And then I thought about it more, I'm like, no, I'm gonna go with one tablespoon of rice. Well, it turns out that I was way, way off. That was way too high, one tablespoon. Now, some of you might have tried to guess as low as possible. You might have guessed one grain of rice. So let's do the math and figure out if that's correct. It's time for John Perry's impersonation of Khan from Khan Academy. We're gonna do some math together. The human genome, I'll draw a little human here, because the arms and legs. <laughs> the human genome is three billion base pairs long. So three, uh, zero, 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 zero. Do I have enough zeros there? Let's see, we got hundreds, thousands, millions and billions, three billion base pairs long. Let's grab another color for our virus. We'll make him yellow. So here's the virus and the little, you know, spike protein and whatnot. Okay, great. So the virus genome is 10,000. So let's, let's do that here. So 10,000 base pairs. Let's put our, uh, Put our units there, base pairs. If you do the math, if you divide 3 billion by 10,000, that is, let's get an, another color here, blue, maybe, nice little blue, 300,000 virus genomes. So we'll put VG for virus genome. You could fit 300,000 virus genomes into the human genome. So if we go to our bag of rice, Let's shrink things down. Actually, let's 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 do this. Well, we'll just move it over here on the side, and we'll do the the other ones over here. So, our bag of rice. There's the rice coming out of the top of the bag. There is five pounds, or two thousand two hundred and sixty-eight grams. So, if we want to figure out what a single uh, virus genome would be in comparison, we need to take this number right here, the 300,000, and divide this number by that. So 2,268 grams divided by 300,000 is, well, let's bust out the calculator here because I cannot do that math in my head. 2,268 divided by 300,000 equals 
0.00756. I'm going to round that up to 0.008. Okay, so 0 0.008 grams, grams, because, you know, we're, we're doing this in grams now. So we need 0 0.008 grams of rice to represent the virus genome. Well, how much does a single grain of rice weigh? I wanted to figure this out, but it turns out that I don't have a scale in anywhere in my house that can measure something as small as a single grain of rice that can weigh something that, that light. I'm not a drug dealer. <laughs> so what I had to do is I had to look it up online. And the number that I got online was 0 0.024 grams. And of course, different types of rice weighed different amounts per grain, but this was a typical number that I was finding online. And look at that. That means that our virus genome can't even be represented by a single grain of rice. In fact, 0 0.008 fits into 0 0.024 three times. That tells us that if the human genome is represented by a five pound bag of rice, the virus genome would be represented by one third of one grain of rice. It is unnoticeably small. All right, so at this point, I probably convinced most of you that a single virus genome, once it's been disabled, is not a big deal for the host. A host can easily handle that. It probably doesn't even notice that it's carrying a virus genome, right? This is why it takes natural selection so long to weed out these virus genomes. It's one of the reasons why. But other people who are watching this might be like, hold on a minute, John, you just used an analogy to, quote, prove that 10,000 base pairs is not a big deal for a cell to handle, right? This rice analogy might not actually be a very good analogy because, yeah, humans don't care about a single grain of rice, especially not one third of a grain of rice. We would never, ever notice in a million years that someone stole one third of a grain of rice from us, right? But maybe the DNA equivalent of one third of one grain of rice really does make a difference for a cell. I mean, how sensitive are cells to extra bits of DNA being added to their genomes? Maybe this is a really big deal, actually. Well, the best way to figure this out for humans, anyways, is to look at healthy humans, people with, without genetic disorders, and look at their genomes and see how much size variation is there between the average human. Here's a really great Oxford publication that did just this thing. When they compared different people from different continents, healthy people without genetic disorders, they found that on the low end, the difference in genome length between different individuals was 4 million nucleotides. And on the larger end, it was up to 30 million nucleotides. That's 30 million, okay? The reason that different people's genomes vary in length there's a couple of reasons for it. One is that during the process of meiosis, you have your chromosomes and they line up and they actually swap DNA with each other. If they misalign, and misalignments happen a lot, especially in repetitive areas of the genome, if they misalign, they can actually produce some chromosomes with extra DNA and some chromosomes that are missing some DNA. And this happens all the time. And because of this, you can just have it you can have a quite rapid expansion in the genome in certain family lines, certain lineages. Human cells are so good at replicating DNA that they don't even notice, really, when there's between 4 and 30 million extra DNA nucleotides that they have to deal with. They just don't even notice. It's unnoticeable. So, of course, 10,000 nucleotides, that's not a big deal at all. Selection should have eliminated this junk. I understand that at first glance, it might seem like having an extra virus genome in your genome is wasteful, but in reality, it's just not. When you look at the actual numbers, it really just is not a big deal for the cell. And that's why natural selection does not weed them out very quickly. It can take millions of years, tens of millions of years. There is even a case of one that's been sticking around in mammals for, we think, probably over 100 million years. So it can take a long time for natural selection to really finally purge these things from our systems. But it does happen. It definitely does happen. Again, right here is one of many papers that talks about how it is that descent with modification acted upon by selection does purge ERVs, but we're gonna save that for another video. This concludes my mini-series inside of a mini-series where I respond to 
angry creationist questions about endogenous retroviruses. Next question. And by the way, the next question won't be from a young earth creationist. The next question I answer will be from someone who actually does care about how biology really works in real life.